I don't, I don't mind kind of talking casually, but yeah. trying to present something. I'm trying to give them a uh, I Interpretation of dreams. Like, you had a dream about me. You had a dream about me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you sure you want to tell the group? <laughs> 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 the dream was about remembering happy dreams. Yeah, I remember it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's odd because I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs>
Because I'm now. <laughs> yes, no. um, you have one of two ways to do these questions. One is the traditional way, which is to answer them with things like footnotes and, um, you know, things like that. On the, on the very way. Uh, the other is to email me if you can get the questions. And let me know which one you're doing. And um, and in that context, you are able to also answer them with a parallel comment using your artwork. And when I say parallel, I don't mean that you're going to explain your artwork, you know, this bit. That, in fact, the work and what you're writing are saying the same thing. Now, they have to be about 3,500 words. So. It just means that you're writing 3,500 words plus 3,500 words equivalent of your artwork. Is that okay? No. <laughs> What's that? One more time. One more time. This time. Um, normally, they have to be 3,500 words. If you also include a piece of artwork. See, I don't want to. I don't want to lessen the value of the artwork by saying it's worth fifteen hundred words, and then your essay is worth fifteen hundred words, or something like that. But would you feel better if I did that? Would you rather do it two thousand words, let's say, with the essay and, and a piece of artwork? Are you able to speak? <laughs> <laughs> I realize you've had a very long time. The time would take. Three and a half thousand. Yeah. Three and a half well, it's either 3,500 words for your for your um, 
piece of writing, or it's a combination. And I'm always loath to assign, because normally what happens is that the, the written work would then be 2,000 words, or 2,500. And then the artwork would be considered, let's say, a thousand words equivalent, which I have no idea what that even means. Um, so um, I'm just being really straightforward with you. And I, I just think in order to answer the questions, you need about 3,000 words. You, pr you just do. I mean, you could probably try to answer it in less, but you'd have to be uh, in the PhD. Although, <laughs> we're crazy. Oh, you don't have to be in the PhD. Um, so, uh, you know, under that famous thing, you know, you didn't have time to be brief. Um, it's actually a luxury to have more words and less. But maybe you don't think so. Dane, what do you think? Okay, excellent. This is what I like. I like getting you guys at the end of the day. I know that you had four tutorials plus the seminar. <laughs> Even I, he needed to take a break after two. <laughs> so, um, okay. Great. So I'm glad that no one can make a decision right now. That's fine. But if it can be kept flexible, no, I'm not writing it, but I suppose if there's a, a certain amount of flexibility, because some people might find that the author explains it really well and they want to keep going, but they then end up maybe just with a thousand words, or, you know, just okay. a few paragraphs. Or right. That will so, not happen. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. so to be more clear, uh, you can go as low as 2,000 words. I would prefer, personally, mm -hmm. if you would stick to 3,500 because it just gives you a sense of what that means in terms of putting thoughts together. However, because I think it would be interesting to see your work in relationship to these questions, um, I, wa I also want to try and be, you know, minimally flexible, <laughs> not maximum. So how about if we strike some sort of deal where uh, you see the questions, you decide whether or not you want to work on them as writing only or writing plus artwork, and then you send me your negotiated settlement. How about that? <coughs> that sound okay? Yeah, yeah. Very easy. Easy peasy. Okay, that was the first thing. Second thing is, in case you didn't know, um, God has been reappointed. <laughs> uh, and, uh, in the, I, I've worn um, in honor of this some punk, uh, you know. Uh, yes, <laughs> I just had to wear my my pro uh, pro Franciscan monk moment. Uh, no, he's not Franciscan. What's the one? He's yeah, yeah. Oh, you're Chris. Is it Franciscan? I know, I know. You know him. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Okay. Um, Since he was a child. Now, now, you with the pubic hair. <laughs> public hair. Public. 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 That's right, public fur or something. Like that. Okay. Uh, right, all right, fine, no, no worries. Um, no, but uh, so Francis, Pope Francis, uh, has come amongst us. And you'll be happy to know that uh, Francis is. Um, is apparently a real shift from the church, in as much as okay, he's not pro-gay, uh, he's not uh, pro-sex, um, he's not. Pro in fact, I'm not sure how radical this man is. Uh, <laughs> actually, when you really thought about, it, except that he's not the last pope. That's as far as we know, and he's alive. Of course, so is the last pope. So I don't know. Yes, he's not from Europe. And he's not from Europe. That's it. I knew that, yes, yes. There's some liberation theology thrown in there. That's it, yeah. Anyway, we'll see. Anybody else have comments on this? They said they say he was involved in some kind of killing 9,000 people with Peron. Excellent! Oh, well, well, then there's yeah. no change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, I read an article this morning about that. Yeah. Where was the article from? Uh, I don't remember. It was, in, it was an Italian, say, online newspaper, and they said, yeah, he was involved in some in the desaparecidos. Oh, he was involved with the desaparecidos. Yeah, yeah. And he was like represented the right wing of the Peronist movement. So, yeah. All is restored. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> much better now. Okay. Uh, okay. So that that's all I had to announce for today's announcement. Um, uh, now let's just get stuck in. I asked you if you could bring your dreams. Remember that. Did anybody bring dreams? 
Did anybody have a dream? I mean, dream. you have dream performance anxiety. Okay. All right, well, before we do the dream bit, there's a couple people that brought dreams. You bring a dream? It's. Don't it's tell me a dream. It's an old one. It's, well, it's old, an old dream. Old, old, uh, it's like maybe four or five months ago. Huh. Anybody have more, more recent dreams? It doesn't have to be recent. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was hoping to be recent, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a recent dream. You have a dream? Yes. Okay, good. We have one semi-recent? Yes. Yours is four months old, so that's marginally recent. I have a recent. I, have, I don't have it written. That's right. No, you, you didn't have to have it written. It just had to, had to be a dream. And you have a dream. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Well, they all have dreams. I know, it's, it's tough. <laughs> okay, let me just set, I'd just like to set out a couple parameters so that you have a sense of where we're going with this and what's at stake. The first thing is, is that with Freud, particularly with the interpretation of dreams, but not only the interpretation of dreams. Also, I asked you to take a swing at jokes in the unconscious. Um, but in any case, um, he's tra he's talking about the field of judgment, and I want you to get a sense of how judgments operate, particularly when the judgment is is rooted in a sexual um, anxieties, or to be slightly different, all judgments are rooted in some form of sexual anxiety. You will be pleased to know Luke, <laughs> yes, who was very upset with Leotard last week. <laughs> anyway, we'll pick on Luke today. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Now, the question of judgment uh, is, of course, linked to the question of truth. And as I hope you know from going through the text and the work, there are at least two types of truth that we've been dealing with at this term. One type of truth would be that which is constructed, or that which is, let's say, constituted, or that which is assembled. I'm going to try different words here. And that assemblage forms a, a type of material. And that material forms a condition. And that condition forms a ground. And that ground forms the way in which your relationship to truth gets known to you. Now, it's a different form of ground than the ground that you actually walk on, because we now know from this whole semester that it's basically a surface, this ground. So the material that is assembled, that forms a condition, that forms a ground, is not a ground like on the floor. It's something that allows one to be able to make something coherent stick. And if it can stick, then it is said to have a form, or in fact is, truth. Why? Because it is a form around which one is dealing with the now without invoking time. or let's say dealing with the present without having to say that it's going to change every time, every five seconds. In fact, it's very hard to get out of the present. You can't get out. You're in, you're in that space. So I started off by saying we're talking about judgments, how judgments are made, how judgments get formed. Now, the, the making of a judgment Freud is going to make an, a claim, which is developed in his work, which we went into a little bit last semester. But he's going to make a claim that they are projections. So these assemblages that, that occur are projected. And the projections are what land somewhere on that ground, or even land on yourself. So, like, let's say I'm projecting to Dane, and my projection lands on Dane. And we have, like, a link then. And that link forms a ground around which we can communicate. Now, 
Heidegger is going to refer to that as a relation between little entity and Dasein. These are very big terms, even though they're complicated and have many layers to them. Because Freud wants to say that you can get a very clear sense of how the judgments are formed when you look at how the unconscious begins to speak. Because the <coughs> unconscious, as we will get into in a minute, doesn't have a voice, but is the site around which a lot of things are held in your history, you're like a little filing cabinet, except it's not ordered. There's no order in the unconscious. Now, Freud will say also that in order to be human, one must be and one is. So must as an ought and must as an is, is, versus, is and ought, neurotic. A neurotic <coughs> means that you're not closed. Your personality is not closed. If your personality becomes closed, either you become an automaton, a sociopath, a psychopath, or you're not at all human in any respect. So the neurosis is what keeps your uh, ability uh, to stay open your ability to remain human as an opening. And the opening is part of this projection. So the very most important thing, if you've learned nothing else about Freud, is <coughs> not so much the sexual, although that's not such a tragedy if you got that too, but that he understands knowledge as something that is uh, created socially that is internalized via projection. It's internalized via projection. So your psychic scars that you have as children have happened in part because your parents or your love object people, the people who love you, or anyway, the people that you met when you were first born, projected their views onto you. And you, of course, projected your views, little as they were, onto them. And these create a relationship. Now, as I said in the first semester, first term, there are different phases that one goes through. But basically, what you need to get a sense of is that the unconscious is a cauldron, a bubbling, sexualized, polymorphous, uh, polymorphously sexual. What, what I mean by that is that pretty much anything can be sexual and any element of the body can be sexual, and any element that you find on the ground can be sexual, this fork can be sexual, the computer can be sexual, anything is sexual from the point of view of polymorphous perversity. And when I use the word perversity, I don't mean it in a negative sense, I mean it in a, in a heterogeneic <coughs> sense. So, everyone is born polymorphously perverse, polymorphously sexual, so not bisexual, not heterosexual, just po just sexual, basically, in whatever form, in all forms. And in one's makeup, argues Freud, there is the relationship of this thing called the superego, which you will have read about last time. And the superego is basically starts off as the one as one's parents, or the the family law, anybody that's in a family, which is pretty much everybody in this room who's had brothers and sisters, you're in a pecking order. You could be first born, you could be last born, you could be the only one born, but you, you've got some sort of myth that you're born into. <coughs> in many Jewish families of which I'm a part, you know, you're born, you know, my son, the doctor, has just been born, you know, you know like the, my daughter, the princess. You know, you know you're already brought, brought into an entire arena that you just inserted into this kind of story. Now, that's the first beginning of how your superego, your own superego, starts to get developed. And the superego is that horrible voice in your head telling you that you're a disaster, you are stupid, whatever you do is wrong. And part of that voice is the, vo is the initial voice of your either your family or your church or your environment or somebody 
that you l had a love op your initial love object relationship to. Now, as it goes on, that's say as your life goes on, Freud makes the argument that the superego becomes the societal laws, the societal common sense. So when you transgress that, when you break from that, when you go against it, which everyone does, not because they just happen to be teenagers, but because in order for your ego, as opposed to the superego, as long as for your ego to make itself manifest, to make itself manifest, I'm going to use those terms, to make itself become there, or become here, to make itself show up, you've got to fight the superego. The superego's task is to bring you into the fold. But your task is to be not fully brought into the fold, otherwise you become psychotic, sociopath, dead, catatonic, not able to think for yourself, whatever, these various things. So the ego is continually asserting itself. But in your mind, think of the ego as a bridge between the superego, as a, as a kind of drawbridge. Kind of come down, kind of can go up. Kind of come down, kind of, kind of go up. A drawbridge between the superego and your, what's called id, id, id. And the id is this, like I was saying, this untamed sexual polymorphous environment. It's just bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. So this is the basic tenet that he's setting up to start to talk about how personalities get established, how guilt starts to operate. And the stronger your superego, the more you the more you'll have a path cut out for you and you'll know your path. You'll go on your path. You'll have a path, you'll go on the path. The more you assert your ego, the less you know your path, the more frightening it is. Of course, the healthy person is someone who can assert the ego, not reject the superego, but figure out some relationship where the ego can get like, let's say, 51% of the share, and the superego gets 49%. But in reality, what happens, or in capitalist reality, what um, uh, Freud is arguing, uh, that doesn't happen. What usually happens is that the superego wins. And the, and the question is, what's the degree to which the superego really wins? What's the degree you wake up one day and realize, I am my mother, or I am my father, in all the things that you totally disloved or disliked about them? What, what happened? And that's when the superego, that's when you sort of step right into that superego moment, despite all your attempts to walk gingerly or carefully away from it. Now, Marcuse has a workout called One Dimensional Man, One Dimensional Man, where he basically argues that the society that we live in is based on, well, all civilizations are based on repression, what he calls basic repression, what Freud would call basic repression, where the superego and the ego have to kind of battle it out, and the ego has to be slightly repressed, otherwise it would just become... Uh, sort of anarchic in a bad way, in the sense that nothing would work. It, you'd have you'd have gangland problems, you'd have, you know, kind of chaos and you know, disrespect of the world. Yeah, does the super ego necessarily come from the family? Uh, well, the fa the question is, the family comes from the society. Okay, so in fact, it all comes from the social, and that's what sets Freud apart from, let's say, psychology from psychologists. Freud is making an argument that is around the sciences. He's, he, he wants to bring psychology or the, the, the psyche into the sciences, not into the myths of storytelling, though he does tell a lot of stories to get there. So he's, what he's trying to do is say that the family, <coughs> while important, is also brought into this whole social network, which it also has to deal with. So for example, at some point, maybe you guys might want to have a house. Maybe the house you might want to have costs money. Maybe the house that you might want to have that costs money requires you to get a bank loan. Maybe a bank loan means you have to have a job. Maybe the, you know, suddenly everything's like, 
and then you have children, and then suddenly you know they, they hate you because you don't have any money. And you know, so you have all these issues going on, and finally this radical you has to end up being this kind of very conservative you know, accountant somewhere. I say this very respectfully for any accountants out there. But if you see, so there's this, so one ends up often having to repeat the nightmares, having just gone this long trajectory to get away from it. Okay, so, you with me so far? You see, so, so Freud, yeah. scientist, Freud, psychoanalysis, emphasis on analysis, i.e., uh, not psychology, not the logic of the psyche in this kind of Greek myth sense, but that there's actually a way that he's looking at how these moments of assemblage happen. So that a certain form of truth, your truth, my truth, gets put out there. And the truth is caught up with the sexual impulses and when your folks are going, forget it, Shh. that's not right. Sit with your legs closed. You know, stop playing with yourself. You know, whatever, whatever happens, whatever these various you know mentions are. Don't eat the, the dirt on the floor, which a lot of people do as children. You know, don't stop putting things in your mouth. Whatever. You know, I went through the whole edible anal phases last time. We're not going to go through it today. Now, these little scars that happen to you are deposited in various parts of the mind and body. I mean the, psych the psychical scars. I don't mean like literally getting beaten up or having cigarettes put out on you. I mean like those, that's bad enough. But the, the emotional scars get put somewhere. They don't get put, there's not like a little filing drawer and they get stuck in like very neatly. But they're, they're in this place of the, e of the id and the unconscious, this realm, which is also really a surface. So again, if you broke open the brain, just like if you broke open your iPod, you would find like a little filing center of all your scars. But it's just this constituted thing. It's pretty interesting, considering he's coming up with this in 1899 and 1900 and so on. So it's, it's interesting that he's, he's predating the whole computer revolution. Now, the next part of this that you need to get a sense of, and then we can open this up for the dreams, is that when you have this relationship between the scars that are in you. Your mind remembers, re-dash members. They're like little members, and they re-stick re them together. And your dreams call upon those pieces, those little material pieces in your head. Remembering that the material pieces in your head are actually these social projections. So. So they're not just, that, that's why I'm so nervous about you using the word perception or intuition. <laughs> because I worry that you think it's internal when in fact it's always this projection that's going on. Even a dream that's in your head sleeping is actually still a projection. And this dream, this set of dreams, happens, he basically makes four different points about the stream. There's many, but these are the four I'll just locate them for you. The first is that whatever dream you have usually uses information from the day before. That's why I was curious. I mean, we can have five months ago, but that's why it's useful, because you can actually analyze a dream better if you actually have the, um, a, piece, a paper and a pen or your computer or something next to you and you wake up immediately to write it down. Because the other thing about the dream is that it disappears almost moments after you have it. He's got a whole section in Dreams of the Unconscious explaining why he thinks that happens, what it is about the forgetting of the dream, which he finds much more interesting than the remembering of the dream. But anyway, so the first thing about the dream is that it it deals with the familiar, but the recent familiar. But it deals with it via what he will call a wish fulfillment. Now the wish fulfillment doesn't mean you really wish this could happen. So for example, we had somebody talk about their, their dreams uh, the other day in a PhD class, and the person talked about how um, they were always worried when they spoke in front of places because they always had a dream before that where all their teeth fell out. Um, now, that's quite a revealing dream, and we didn't analyze it in the class then because it was too revealing. 
in that case. But that kind of dream, the teeth are always a sexual a sign of sexual prowess. Obviously, if you lose all your teeth, then it's not that you're wishing that you would fold and go underground. Uh, it's not that you. That's not that's not the wish. The wish is that you die, so that you don't have to perform this. So that's it's a very powerful kind of wish. That's why when one wakes up in those kind of environments, you just feel horrible because you've been made to have to become completely exposed. <coughs> it's also an exposure type dream. Uh, we'll get into these different things. Now, so he, what he's saying here, so a wish for film, I don't think it's, it's this happy thing, I wish that I, you know, I wish I had my two front teeth for Christmas or whatever thing it is, you know. It's not that kind of wish. It's a wish for film, a lot of times the wishes that are in the dream really are revenge wishes. You're actually wishing that somebody dies, not yourself usually. Though not always, it depends. If it's really one of those, like personally, you know, knife in the head type of dreams, then yeah. Uh, the second thing you need, or the third thing, you need to have a sense of. Uh, second thing, sorry. Second thing you need to have a sense of about dreams is that they operate off of two different axes, a x e s. I don't mean x. <laughs> I mean a x i s times plural. So axis, but plural axes. It operates off of two axes. One is called condensation, and one is called displacement. And condensation is like when you microwave something and you just have something left because you've left it on too long, and it kind of shrinks down to nothing, like I did with spinach today. So then it becomes inedible, but you have something left over, and the leftover is the condensated moment. So a condensation doesn't mean that it's a symbol. It doesn't mean that it's the condensed symbol of something. It means that if we took this entire room, we shrink wrapped us down to a dot, that would be the condensated version of this space right here. You can do that in your work. You're, in fact, the work often, with the, certainly with the layers, can work in tr into this form of how you can take elements and make them totally a tiny precipitate. So for those of you that are into sciences, for example, you know what a precipitate is? Does anybody know what that word means, precipitate? Okay. <laughs> what comes in after reaction? Yeah, it's something that's left over. Yeah, it, it's, like a residue. it's a residue. So the condensation is a residue of taking the whole thing and making it tiny, making it into a little freeze-dried package or, you know, extra um, microwave moment. When I first learned Freud uh, and this thing, we had to do it by science classes, and they, at that time you could boil things. So it's so totally different. That was only last year. Uh, but, you know, so the precipitate is when you boil something down and there's something left over, like salt, let's say, out of, out of water. And so if salt is in your dream, it's a precipitate. It's a condensed thing. So you're not actually thinking, what's the, what does salt symbolize? It's not that. It's that the salt is the leftover of the condensing of something. And then, that's step, you got that? Because that's complex. So when you think of salt in your dream, that's not a symbol of salt in a dream. It's not standing for a wound. Well, it could be standing for a wound, but it, the wound would have to be something that it shrunk from and left salt mm -hmm. as a remainder. The second aspect that goes not on the other side, but right alongside condensation, is what is called displacement. And displacement is, the usual example of it is when you kick a dog because you've had a bad day. The dog is just sort of sitting there going whatever. And then you walk in and that's it for the dog. That's, that's displacement. You've taken your anger and you've moved it over to somewhere else. So for example, uh, someone with a much stronger uh, sense of uh, a presence would probably not have the teeth falling out dream type of thing. They might have someone else's teeth fall out because they wouldn't want to have it on themselves, even though that's their fear. So 
they move it over somebody else in the dream. So the two things that you need to think about in the dream before you even get to symbols is, is that thing that you're looking at a precipitate, that is to say a condensated thing, or is it a displacement, or both? Because sometimes the condensation is the displacement. Got it? By the time you finish with this, you're like so exhausted, you care about your dreams, you know, like, like whatever. Now, remember also that the dream is usually, not always, but usually everything <coughs> in the dream is you. So whether or not the dream is about the cows in the field, you are both the cow and the field. And sometimes it's your relationship to something else that precipitates the cow being the con condensated, condensated thing. But basically, it still goes back to this wish fulfillment, and it goes back to, again, the polymorphous perverse situation. OK. Yeah, that, so that's the second major thing. The third major moment about the dream is that the dream uh, is usually uh, a comment on uh, some form of anxiety that you're having that will reach back into the treasure trove of all your scars and bring them forward in case you haven't resolved them. <laughs> so lucky you, if you had a rotten childhood and then the day before you had a rotten day, the great news is that you might be able to solve it all because it will throw up, literally, all your horror. So the dark, complex, feel crummy sort of dream, dream that you might have, usually is able to explain this in terms of the little tiny scars that you have put into your, your arsenal on your way to the dream. So again, these repeat dreams that we're talking about, this kind of thing, uh, these are all part of the story of how your unconscious starts to <coughs> Um, speak to you. So the last thing is that a dream for Freud is nothing to do with divinity. He's going to mention this. He is a scientist through and through. He doesn't, it's not so much he doesn't believe in God or does believe in God. God is irrelevant here. A dream is not a portent. I mean, I, it's, a dream is not a portent. It's not, I didn't say a dream is not important, okay? So a dream is not foretelling something. A dream is not an oracle. So if you have something that resembles an oracle, or you dream something and then the thing that you dream literally happens, that's an incredible coincidence. He's not for a minute suggesting that it's connected. And you need to deal with that, just so you know. Okay, any questions so far on that? Right. The role of the superego in dreams? Well, the role of superego is precisely this negotiated guilt beater. You know, so the, the, the higher your guilt content in your dream, the higher you feel ashamed, the stronger your superego in this. Not necessarily. Especially if you're trying to do something new and you're frightened and you're asleep, then the dreams can be even more nightmarish than the day, although probably nightmares during the day. This is our upbeat seminar for today, so I yeah. um, <laughs> You want to go back to the entire opening of the fold. <laughs> that was like walk in the park next to us. Okay, um, questions so far before we get to the, 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 the kind of rough stuff? Yeah? Um, 
The what thing? The salt. The, the salt, the yeah. Um, made me think, is it the son of Solomon, the Tower of Salt in the distance? But then I was thinking, it's way before Freud, isn't it? And then, you know. I mean, the, what do you mean, the Tower of Salt? Jesus, um, do you mean Lot's wife? That's like Lot's wife, yeah, Lot. And then and his daughter. And then in the back of the painting, there's the city which is turned into salt. Um, no, that's actually not the myth. No, okay. The myth is, I know this only because it was drilled into us as children. Uh, and then I ended up writing on it because one does these kind of things. Uh, Lot's wife, who obviously didn't have a name, that was my first feminist remark. <laughs> Lot's wife, named Lot's wife, um, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, at where they were all having multiple sex parties. Like the like this lovely book that we went over today uh, earlier, Grace and I, with Cameron. It was very similar to that. So it was a lot of debauchery and everything else going on, and um, God apparently showed up to um, Lot and said, you know, this is a despicable place and it needs to go. And Lot said, give me, you know, give me a little while. Let me try, try 50 good people and it'll be fine. So he went around trying to find 50 good people that failed. He negotiated again for a lower number and eventually came down with the idea that he'd find 10 people that failed as well. So um, he said, okay, then I'll run away, uh, but I want to take my wife and my, my daughters with me. And, um, and God said, you can do that on one condition, and that is that you know, your wife, that nobody looks back. Because what I'm gonna do is so horrible to Sodom and Gomorrah for being so terrible and, and wicked and whatever, that I'm going to you know, <coughs> get everybody out. And so they, they ran, and he made this explanation to the wife and the daughters, and said, don't look back. So uh, Lot's wife couldn't bear the idea of leaving. And she turned around and looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. That's where the pillar of salt thing comes up. Now, the rest of the story is that Lot decides to sleep with his daughters. <laughs> you know, I mean, the story just gets worse and worse. You're just thinking, okay, first the wife doesn't have a name, then he ends up sleeping with the daughters. Okay, it just gets, and then they have children, and you know, it's like the whole thing goes on. Anyway, um, but that's where the salt comes from. Yeah. Any other questions about salt? <laughs> <laughs> What? Oh no, no I, I missed the salt bit. Um, oh yeah, all right. So the salt being the precipitate uh, <coughs> is, is the part of the dream that's the condensation. Right. Dreams have two parts, condensation and displacement. Right. Or two forms of material. Now, the reason I put it in terms of two forms of material is to get you to think about how a material, something that has a material to it, the material can be condensation, that can be the material. It can be displacement. That can be the, the material. So for example, let's say you're using sound waves in your work. They can be working off of condensation and displacement. And you're not then doing sound art. You're doing something with the material that allows for this condensation and displacement to happen. There? OK. Any other questions so far? OK. Yeah, what was your dream? Sorry? Did you have a dream? Oh no, or was it Stella? Who had the dream? I said, I said I had a dream, but now I don't. I know, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of salt. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Two more salt, too much salt. Okay, you want to tell your dream then because it's further away, or is that just too revealing? Uh, it's, I don't know, I can't, yeah. I, I wrote in Italian. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> okay. So I dreamed about I was playing in a band. We were having a gig with my housemates, and there was another unknown guy. But he was playing by himself on his own. And then there was, there was many people looking at, like watching us. And then we went down the stage. And my friend, another person that I met in Italy, my old friend from high school, he gave me like uh, a pair of like waterproof boots. His waterproof boots, and they felt his, very his waterproof boots. Yeah, yeah. And they were very. I felt them very large in my feet. And uh, in fact, mm. I, I I was feeling like a cloud. And. Then I, I went inside these people, I, uh, I went between the people, 
that were looking for us. And then, uh, meanwhile, the, the unknown guy was playing and, um, and it was asking many, uh, you saw, I mean, many, many, many of, um, clubs, like many yeah. cheering for it um, at the end of the songs. And that's why he, he, I felt he was a clown as well, but also a winner. And then I, I asked, and he was uh, um, waiting for some people to like pull up their hands. So I put up my hand and I asked like a very ridiculous question to him, which I don't know. That's why. Anyone want to give it a go? Anybody quite have questions for that time before we give it a go? <coughs> Don't remember, but I think maybe I try to make. I, I've tried to make when I when I wrote it. Maybe it wasn't exactly like that. You know, I, when you wake up, you kind of try to make sense of you know the things mm -hmm. in the dream. So I think I could kind of analyze myself with this dream you know, a little bit. Like Wait, before you do, before you do, yeah. was it in color? Okay. Was it in color? Yeah. It was in color? Yeah. Does everybody dream in color? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anybody ever dream in one color? It's also significant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's signifi it's a, that's a significant yeah. aspect. Um, okay, so it was in color. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, uh, okay, that's the first thing. But uh, quite dark, anyway. So the colors were dark, so was it inside? Yeah. And there was a stage? Yeah. And the stage then had people in front of it? Yeah. And you were first on the stage? I was on the stage. With this band? Yeah. Which was your housemates? Yeah. Okay, and how many housemates? No, just it was me, actually it was me and one of my housemates. And then this other this, person? This, this guy, yeah, and then he, he went to play. And how team. did you feel about this guy? Did you think that he was intruding on your space or he was part of it? Uh, yeah, I think he was. Uh, uh, yeah, intruding. In intruding. Yeah. Yeah. And was he playing an instrument? I think so. Yeah. And yeah. what instrument was that? I think it was most probably guitar. A guitar. And what about the instrument you were playing? Uh, I I think I might have been singing. Singing. Just, yeah. And what but about your housemate? Yeah, he's a guitar player. Okay. <laughs> okay. Does this help anybody else out now? And which, no, no, which, me. which one of the people shoes you had later? Which one of the people? Which, uh, which one of those guys you got waterproof shoes from? He's a totally not a guy. He comes from high school. So, so it comes from your past? Yeah. And that yeah. guy who came from your past, yeah. what was your relationship with him? Oh, we were friends. What kind type of, of friend? Like, like uh, you were like the only two friends in the school? Or no, no, not very close to each other. But we were in the same class, and uh, you know, we just you know we were good friends, not like super close friends, but you know having fun together, you know going to play football or whatever with the classmates. And um, he was a very big guy. That's why the, the big boots and wouldn't feel very comfortable. Okay. Uh, yeah, Johnny. You say he was quite a lot of the friends in the past, so. You always refer to him as was, <coughs> or you had, or he was. So was it something that's happened in the past before? I mean, it doesn't. It, it didn't. I mean, there was just this reference, in the past, like this guy, and that's it. And or did you have any shoes on beforehand? Uh, yeah, that's that's I remember. But uh, you make me thinking. Maybe I didn't because he gave. So and did you have any clothes on? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Did everybody have clothes on? Any other questions so far? And when you woke up, were you, uh, how did you feel? Did you feel happy, sad, confused, mad? Uh, very confused and quite, um, as I said, like a bit of like a clown. Like a clown, like humiliated a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like you had been trying to do something and then this guy shows up who nobody knows, yeah. everybody loves, and then somebody in your past. Kind of big was a clown as well for me, anyway. Both of us, like all the situation was like, nobody yes. was a real kind of winner, but he actually was at the other time. Okay, so 
obviously there's some part of you that intervened in the stream so that you didn't get too humiliated in your own fear of being yeah. humiliated. Yeah. So you try to make it seem as though, well, everyone's a clown. Yeah. Right? On some level, right? Anything else? Dane, you want to give it a go? No? Okay, so you should, not always, but often, when there is this concept of the house that's usually, at, or that you're inside something that is uh, dealing with, if you're walking down <coughs> into something versus walking up into something, if you're walking down, then you're exploring an unconscious or, or a complicated, uh, let's say, challenging, uh, not worked out scenario. So usually a a ground floor or a first floor is much more of a kind of known scenario, and you go into an unknown scenario, and the unknown is uh, far more scary because it's technically dealing with your either pre-conscious or unconscious, and you're trying to deal with that, and you're trying to calm yourself down by reaching into a past scenario, and it's not working. And so your your fear, it, it strikes me as a very, um, it strikes me that it's a, a fearful dream. It's a dream that, uh, that you don't, uh, that you would almost feel sick, like want to throw up, but you can't, because that would be even more humiliating. So you're going to pretend to be fine, and the pretense is what is going to, you, you're, you're telling yourself, if I just pretend to, that everything's fun and okay, it'll be okay. And your, your way of dealing with that is to know behind that that that's not okay. So it's that kind of a ambiguous dream, I would say. That would be my like lay version of this. And the reason I make those kind of claims, I mean, not the, you know, you have to be proper analytic, an, anal, an, an, um, someone who analyzes this, um, but because of the relationship of the way in which the people from the past come in, and come out, the shoes, the, shoe, the shoes and the feet, the toes, it's always very sexual. Uh, you don't want to get wet, so you're, not, you're afraid of letting go. This, this is very <coughs> classic in that sense. Um, and the, the afraid of getting wet is uh, afraid of the yeah, sexual. Yeah, you want waterproof. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta work on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say that with love. Um, but, um, <laughs> Does that at all make any sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Anybody else want to be revealing or concealing? <laughs> yeah, did you have one? Uh, I, it's an old one, but one year. So okay, old ones, I guess that's what we're going to deal with today. <laughs> yes? It's, it's very strange as well. But <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. go on. Well, I dreamt about a snake. Hold on. Okay. This is before you come in here? Come into? Yeah, it was last, <coughs> last April. Last April, okay, so you hadn't was, come into this um, environment yet. It was like, at the time I was still searching for universities, I wasn't sure what I'm going to do, what I was going to do. Okay. Well, I dreamt uh, about a snake, a silvery snake, flat and very thin, and he, he was supposed to be in love with me, and he was uh, like slithering around my whole body, and he would come close to my face and look at me straight in the eyes. And well, I was scared, but um, my friends wanted to kill it, and I didn't. I I felt bad. I didn't really want to, but I didn't say to them, you know, don't kill it. But they they felt that we should kill it. So um, I like called it, I, like, because he was like my my friend. So I called him and we tricked him. And uh, well, no, at first um, I called him. He. It, it came to me and it, uh, it stared uh, at me at the eyes. It was very intense in my dream. And it kissed me like twice. First in the upper lip and it was like taking some of my blood. And then in the sec in the other lip. And at that time, the a girl uh, that I take um, what the Keros has, uh, uh, this weapon. Uh, a scythe. A scythe? You mean that one of the things that you yeah, cut yeah, weak with? Yeah, yeah. And he, he, she came upon him, but he missed, she missed it. And he understood that he was being attacked, and then he attacked back. 
and uh, I found the I found some shoes on the ground, and I you found shoes as well. Yeah, <laughs> and I showed them to, to him, and he understood that he was straight, and that I was his enemy now. And uh, well, m my friend then uh, found the found a glove. A glove, I don't know. And a glove. A, a glove. Yeah. Um, no, a glove. Club. Club. Oh, club. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, and started so, yeah. uh, like hitting him, and I did the same. I was hitting him, and I was crying, and and then uh, it it shrieked, and it fell to the ground, and then it became a naked man, and then it started. Uh, we was very, we were very anxious and very scared and panicked, and then the man changed into a cat. It started moving, and then. I was I, I I tried to find something to kill it. To, to kill it and I found a paintbrush, <laughs> big paintbrush, <laughs> and I stabbed him in the stomach and then in the head and died. And I woke up and I was crying and then I closed my eyes again and I saw it like lying sleeping. I saw the cat sleeping in front of my doorstep. In your dream, the cat was sleeping in front of your doorstep. Yeah, the, the whole scene was happening in front of my door, in front of my, outside my, do my door, my house. Of your house? Yeah, the door. Not outside. the door of your bedroom? No, no, the door, door outside the door of my house, and the, the entrance. Front door. Front door, yes. It was strange, that's why I wanted to, and very intense. And I, what color was it in me? It was very bright, yeah. and the silvery that the snake had. It was also, and it, the 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 eyes that it, that's why I said it twice. It was very like powerful. I felt like very an, an energy in my sleep. It was very. And how big was the snake in relation to yourself? It it wasn't just too big, like like that. <laughs> so it's like, and it was thin and. Like it was it like a cobra, or was it? Well, it was. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, but so not like not too many, too too much. But it was flat. It was flat. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Were you in a relationship? No, uh, but I was out. Had you been in? Like you been in? Uh huh. Why'd you ask for that? Anything else? Yeah, Joanne? Did you say this was while you're looking to go to university? Yeah, it was, it, it was a kind of bad uh, time in my life as well because I was very messed up and, and out of the uh, was trying to get over any relation, maybe. Thing. And then I was trying to see what I'm going to do in my life and it was a very strange period. Yeah, it was in Greece, yeah. So, usually snakes are female, not male, in Greece. Um, and that's in itself interesting. Um, and it's obviously sexual um, in the sense that it, I mean, apart from just the kissing and the intensity and the power and the attraction and this kind of thing, so there's all this um, you know, situation going on with that. I mean, that's the kind of dream that um, you really need a whole lot more information to really sort of make sense of, but on, you know, sort of on the face of it. Uh, I guess my question would be, do you think that the snake was, was a condensed something, or a displaced something, or something else altogether? Do you think the snake was symbolic of something, or was actually a combination of things that became the precipitate, as it were, was the salt. Well, um, at first I thought it was like um, like the, the the displacement that was actually uh, because when it was a snake and I, in my dream I was thinking it was a he and, and and then it became a man. But then I, I can't I think I I think I thought it in my sleep that I cannot kill a man, so I made it a cat. 
I don't know if it makes sense or if I thought of this after after I woke, woke up, but I was like, well, it was a man and I was kidding him. And I, when I woke up, I felt really guilty and bad. And I was like, why did I see that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if, um, <coughs> if it was combination. Maybe it was, but I'm, I, it was, it, it, uh, I, maybe it was also a person, a certain person, but. Okay. I don't know if I asked. Yeah. Can it be displacement in like all the things that the snake felt and did was what you felt and wanted to do maybe to someone else? Changing the forms. There's a yeah. snake, there's a human, there's an animal again, a cat, and changing the forms and if you like those changing of thought and aggression towards it. Yeah. I think it's more, this is you, you are the snake, yes. and I kind of would read it the same, <coughs> and you're trying to kill this changing creature that, that overtook you, so, so there is, you're trying to kill parts of yourself, basically, mm -hmm. and fighting with parts of yourself, I don't know, I would read it that one. Yeah, that would be, the, that would be kind of like the, the usual, very basic, this is, I say this with a lot of respect because obviously it takes years to make analysis of dreams, okay? It's not preventing us from trying it anyway, but um, that, that's why I want you to get a sense of how a precipitate operates, you know, and to recognize that you're all parts of the same view, you're all parts of the dream, including your friend, your band member, and so on and so forth. So um, it's like if you are a snake, and if you are also the cat, and if you're also the man, and if you're also all these entities, is it possible that what has happened to you what has happened to you, and in order to deal with it, you had to put it in yourself to take have control? So the self that would have control beat you up, and the self that would um, not allow you to go, it's yourself. But in reality, the self that is really yourself is this other entity. Does that sound, does that even make any sense? Because at the end of the day, you have to go back and ask yourself, does that, is that, does that hit it? Could, could, could be, I mean, uh, I have thoughts like, um, I'm being against, oh, that's maybe that all of us just um, think, um, I'm being against, against of myself and I blame me or, you know, I have this, Well, if the superego, for example, is strong enough, which usually it is, then it will try to kill off everything. You know, and if you are in, in the situation that that also has that literally in your environment, then in order to live in that environment, you have to protect yourself. But at the same time, if you're trying to escape it, then you can give yourself a rationalization as to why it doesn't work. So it's a way of protecting the ego, and at the same time recognizing that you're, it's a tough moment for you to leave, as it were. And so did you have a dream more than once? This, this one? Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. And I, I had forgotten about it. And I, I was just, uh, I had written down, and, and I saw it like the other day, and I was like, what? And, and I remember making that's yeah. why I thought this because all of my dreams usually are are very like in, um, are not so complicated. Or I just um, l uh, heard something the other day, and I'm watching in my in my dreams. All dreams are complicated, <laughs> yeah. even if they don't seem like they're complicated. Okay. Um, Stella, did that make sense to you? What do you mean? In terms of that, or <laughs> Jacob's sort of. Yes, because it's if I kind thought, of what you were saying yeah, as well. I thought that she was the snake. She was like both herself and the snake. And then she was trying to, yeah, like all parts were her. Yeah. Creepy. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? But you, you won't be dead ever. Sometimes it's weak. Okay, go on. Um, I was in a building, and then we, I just went, just like a high-rise building, and the three of us with Sunday and then mother. 
And then I moved And the somebody was male or female? Oh, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't have. Just go it was male, yeah. And then um, what up to the next form is that the less uh, of the building made. I think as higher I go, I leave, they, they're moaning and, um, and then I carry on. As higher I go, there's less and less of the building. And then do, do they uh, follow you? No, and I completely forget about them <laughs> as well. Uh huh. Yeah. So that was one of and, them. And do you have them? Do you have that more than once that dream? No, but it would. It woke me up. Uh huh. And when you woke up, what did you? How were you? Um, annoyed. I think. And the annoyance was. Uh, I don't know. I'm just generally <laughs> grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a response to Di's comment? Yeah, Johnny. Um, Johnny is going to become our Freudian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just want to ask a question. Go on. Did you say you had this, you've had this dream more than once? No. Uh, but are you saying it's getting developed even more and more? Yeah. Yeah. Like the building itself is a bit, there's some piece missing. There's like the floor is missing, and in the end I'm just climbing up the sides of the wall. Yeah. 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 Y
on it. I leave it with two children and expects of you. Trying to get yourself together and do something and it's difficult. <laughs> yes, that might be true. Now, let's say all of that, I mean, these are very like, basic things. Again, I want to just warn you about, you know, like trying to make, you know, fuller analyses of things that take years to kind of understand. But what I really want, what I'm really hoping you take away from this is what does this do for your own practice? <clears throat> to think about these kind of dreams, think about uh, the way in which one understands these forms of material materialism, what does it actually mean in your own way of going forward? Do you realize that the work that you're doing not only does come from different parts of yourself, but it must come from different parts. You have to become more tuned to what's going on in your you know, in your mind, in your mind-body. And the mind-body has to have a kind of um, a relationship to, as I said at the beginning, the, the element of judgment, and that one is continually judging situations, but most importantly, one's judging oneself. And that you need to get a sense of how you prevent yourself from becoming you. Now the you that you can becoming, that you are becoming, doesn't necessarily mean this individual, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of a liberal sense of the you that you are becoming. It is actually being in touch with the way in which you can create whatever it is you're trying to do. So it's not like, this is not like a therapy class. We're not asking you to you know, you know, lay on the floor and we'll like have analysis. But to get you to have a sense of how surfaces are part of your makeup and how the surface has to come into, let's say, the, the way in which the work ends up working as art. When I say work, I mean like going to work as art, going to labor, going to uh, getting to work. The word work is such a difficult word actually because when I say it, I, I don't mean that it is um, broken and now it works. I mean that you were unemployed and now you have work. It's that form of the work that is working, that's literally doing a task, that the art is doing a task. And the task it's doing has to do, has something to do with this relationship of your, will always be infected by your relationship of your unconscious to your id and to your superego. And there's a negotiation going on. And you need to be somehow familiar with this. And that the, the ways in which the negotiation happens, happens not via um, a metaphor or symbol, but it happens via this con condensation versus displacement. So before we move on to stage two of this, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Luke? Yeah, the only thing I don't get is the, the dream analysis presupposes a common um, phenomenology, or at least a common yes, good, good. Uh, set of semiotics. Yep. Snakes mean X. Or shoes mean X. Yeah. You know, uh, sword means Y. Well, no, Where no. Do those no, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, where, how come it's similar for everyone? How is it based on everyone's? Yeah, put it slightly different. It's same. not so much salt means you know Lot's wife, and no, 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 not that sort, but, but, but it generally means X. Or right, and why is that? Why and why is that not a symbol for it? Why is like the snake, for example, not the symbol <coughs> of the female? Or you know, because that was the more obvious one, or the shoe and the foot is not the mm -hmm. symbol for phallic relationship. Like, wh why, why does it not literally mean that symbol, A, and B, how has it got this commonality to it? That's, the, that's, that's a very important question, too. Can you think what Freud's answer would be on this? Social 
similar social um, Yeah, so, so yeah. the way in which this projection operates uh -huh. th is the way in which one creates a common ground. And it's the common ground that you're taking in as your experience. Right, okay. Freud only works in Western culture. And is that the well, I mean, Freudian concepts work in right? any culture. It's just that the okay. translation of it okay. would be a Western. I mean, by Western, anything that has a nuclear family. So that uh -huh. doesn't necessarily mean non-Western. But it might mean, like, for example, if you're in tribal environments with different relationships to the socio horizon, mm -hmm. there, I would assume that that symbols would, or that entities that happen would be very different in the, in the dream work. Okay. Has anyone done any sort of anthropology outside of? Yeah, I think that you know, Levi Strauss, mm -hmm. a lot of these people, they, uh, the the structuralists, the early structuralists, were doing a lot of this. Where they, you know, in fact. Which I also find a little bit suspicious, but they find some tribe somewhere, and then they elevate the tribe to like an analysis. I find that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible that you know that that's in fact the case. What's being argued here, though, to the degree to which it makes any sense at all, is that it's a discussion on how uh, a society based rooted in a certain patriarchy. And I mean that in the wider sense of mm -hmm. how it operates. Um, creates elements of hysteria, or how does how does how does a woman? If biology is not destiny, if we take that as a given. If if biology is not destiny, then how does it happen that one becomes female or one becomes male? So if one takes as a given a counterfactual, let's say, because mm -hmm. who knows if it's true or false? But let's say if one takes as a given that biology is not destiny, which is the basic line of a scientific approach, not to mention feminism, but I mean, you know, it's the, 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 that one can, that the brain thinks, it doesn't necessarily think in female ways or male ways or Western ways or Asian ways or black ways or Jewish mm -hmm. ways, or matter, that, that, that there's a mind that think, that, that has this relationship of, of coming to do mathematics and there's not a Jewish way of doing mathematics versus a Muslim way. Something like that. Yeah. Though you could make an argument, maybe there is, but probably there isn't. Or anyway, at some level where it really quote matters, where the matter matters, that biology doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter in that way. So what Freud is saying that the, where biology does matter is where the sexual comes into play. That's so and where disease comes into play, where the skin can collapse and die. This is where biology matters, but it doesn't matter in terms of a pre-given form of male or a pre-given form of female. So he's so a different way of asking the question is if if there is no basis to biology determining male or female, but in fact that's a social construction, then how is it that people become male and female, heterosexual and male and female? How does that actually happen? And not only that. How is it that women tend, stereotypically, to be hysterical? The hysteria, the word hysteria means womb. Deeply annoying, but anyway. Uh, but it means womb. So how is it that women are hysterics and men are stoic? This kind of thing. How, how does it happen? Well, either you believe that there is a, I mean, I, either, it's not, a, it's not a, I don't mean it's an opinion. Either the position of truth is that there's an assemblage of constitutive thing, or something happens on a worldwide basis that creates what turns out to be this thing called male and female, or later on trans and various different um, genders. So to the degree to which there's this replication of these kind of scenarios, then there's something that's going on that creates this libidinal economy. Sorry. This kind, of, this kind of way in which the surface is established uh -huh. that needs to be understood in a way that one gets how it immerses and, and, and comes into each and every body, each and every space body, not each and every body. <laughs> and that's complex. 
Because on the one hand, you you want to uh, acknowledge culture, and on the other hand, you want to deny culture. One wants to deny it. You know, it, is there a thing called the family of man? From the Rousseau perspective, from, as I mentioned before, the argument about democracy and equality was never whether everybody's the same. It was what was one's relationship to law. That everyone, to have an equal society, had to have the same distance to law, no matter whether or not you were male, female, black, white, um, or whatever the situation was, class. It all had to be that there was a law around which one had the same relationship to it. Now, that was argued against by Burke and a lot of these other people saying that, well, women shouldn't have the same distance to law as men in the 1800s and the 1900s, and in fact, up to like 1972 in many countries. In fact, some countries even still today. Because women were still considered either children or hysterical or whatever the story was, and therefore needed to be, quote, protected. In fact, there's a law that's being set up right now, as we speak, in Ireland against abortion, mm -hmm. an, an anti-abortion law, uh, saying that women uh, need to be protected from themselves uh, and cannot make the decision around abortion, that only the men can make the decision, which is really quite shocking, mm -hmm. and that they can only uh, go, uh, and that, that the, what they want to do in Northern Ireland is forbid women the right to private abortions that one can only have an abortion on the NHS means if you have a private abortion, it means that you've made some sort of decision. Whereas if you go to the NHS, the woman ha has to go to a board, and the board has to decide whether or not you're really crazy or not crazy, and how it works. So, so even today, where are we, 2013? <coughs> in this country, or well, you know what I mean, in the UK. <coughs> so, if we're going to argue that there's a problem with that, then one has to make an argument that things are constructed, that things are assembled, that truth is assembled. And Freud is one of the people that argues that it's assembled, that somehow it, there's an assemblage that goes on. And the question becomes, how does that assemblage stick? I mean, did people all do like a group hug and decide, OK, here's what has to happen. The women have to be enslaved, and the men have to kill the father. No. But how did it work? that this became the normal way of being. Super, super eager. Yeah. Okay. And that's what he argues. He argues that there is the relationship of how this thing called the superego gets positioned so that a whole culture can have mass psychosis, basically. Now, there's a lot of things that come from so, this. Like, yeah, sorry. Sorry, back to Pope. Back to who? Back to the Pope. Oh, the Pope. Yes. Yeah, speaking of mass psychosis, he yes. <laughs> said, and I'm quoting from the press, so he may have not said that um, uh, two same sex. God, this came from my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be absolute tosh, but, <laughs> but said uh, that two, um, two same sex people adopting a child is child abuse. Great. Yeah. That changes the whole. Freud's mother father figure. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. How does that work today? Is anyone doing work in that? In Everyone, a lot of people do uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, sure. Who said yeah? There's a yeah over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah, so Jude, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the biggest form of child abuse is in same sex, it is in heterosexual couples, mm. and it's well documented. So when somebody brings that kind of statement out, they're actually not very well informed at all. Mm -hmm. oh, right. it, it, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a statement that I was, I was yeah. questioning, it was the fact that the mother, father figure, father using my destiny, father has been there, yeah. don't exist in those relationships. You see the biggest form of abuse is from the father to the daughter, mm -hmm. or to the son. It, it's, so not, it's not the abuse I'm questioning, it's the idea of there is no father, there's mother and mother. Well, yes, and see, this was... But isn't parenting about... It is surely about giving the child a direction. And, in, you know, we, we don't own that child or that child's thoughts or that child's behaviour. All we can do is guide it. And so, that, therefore, and it's I'm important. I entirely agree, but it, it does mess up for a little bit. No, no, let's yeah. start again. 
Freud is making an analysis of what happens in a heterosexual nuclear family. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, if you don't have a heterosexual nuclear family, then, then it's conceivable that those relationships won't manifest themselves the same way. Right? Because, yeah. like, for example, in those situations where in the 60s, the romantic notion of the 60s, that probably never happened, where you had like 10 parents, you know, where you lived in communes, or in the Israeli um, situation where people were brought up on kibbutzes, mm -hmm. kibbutzims, you know, where you never saw your parents. I mean, it was like they were somewhere else. I mean, you saw them for an hour or something. Or in this country where you are carted off somewhere at the age of five, and you go off to something <laughs> called public school or something like that, <laughs> and, or boarding school, as though this is the most normal thing in the world, you know, <laughs> it's like, and everybody's really, you know, oh, I'm missing my daughter, missing my son, but, you know, oh well, <laughs> they're gone for 12 years. Okay, <laughs> like, those kind of things have, you know, problems. They, they, so this, this general um, sort of framework of how a nuclear family exists, what Freud is doing is he's showing here are how these problems emerge. Here's how this is a problem. But what he's also saying is this is the base of civilization. This is the base of a, a, a male, a female, and children. You know? Now, he's also making the argument that um, you know, a, a, gir a girl child, she's a boy child, realizes that she doesn't have a penis and thinks that she's been castrated. Now, this is a big assumption whether or not the girl ever sees the boy, A, and B, would not think that something's the matter with the boy. You know, like this is like, you know, rather than, you know, like, you know, like, you know, what's happened to you? You know, it's like, poor thing. You know, um, that must just be awful. And I'm going to take that off. You know, like, you know, that kind of thing. Like, you know, there are other ways of looking at this, you know. Um, so, but Freud, I think rightly so, explains how misogyny and how patriarchy starts to develop these kind of positions and how the society actually does create penis envy and you know whatever it is you know the, you know everything that's considered tall and thin and standing in a, in a in a parking lot somewhere must be phallic you know or if it's laying this way like a sports car it must still be phallic you know like for those of us that drive sports cars that's always annoying you know however however i know that you're not you, but you're right this is the fear this of course it's the fear this is the fear that you would have uh, a group of people, a collective of people bringing up children, that's just odd. That's going to break down nuclear familyhood. I'm not saying it is odd. No, no, no. Uh, I'm it's saying, saying it's odd. Yeah. I, Freud is saying it's odd. That, you know, it's, it's a miracle that, that gay marriage passed here by the conservatives. You know, I mean, not that I'm for mar marriage, because I, I, think that's, I think the whole institution should be shot, but all right, you know, that's just where I'm coming from. But, you know, it, so that the Pope would make these kind of things already, <laughs> you know, he's, he's not going to say, 12 hours in the job, you know, it's like so irritating. Anyway, um, they do have the argument that he is meant to be trying to attack the evangelical uh, element of the African Catholicism and therefore get rid of sort of the witchcraft side that's crept back into uh, the Catholic Church in African states, but I mean, to do it this way seems completely mm. wrong. That, that, that is an explanation of the Pope. This oh. reminds me of those uh, <laughs> in Poland a few years, years ago. ago. We had oh, is that? Ever since it wasn't Polish. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he gave a revelation. No, I can't. But that's kind of what I think. It reminds me of like a few years ago in Poland. Uh, there was a kind of large amount of stories about the pedophilia and the kind of very media kind of target pedophilia and what's happening. And then one of the minister, uh, minister of education actually, he actually publicly, publicly stood out in front of the press. It's like, in, sorry, and he said, all gay people are pedophiles. In front of everyone, in front of the whole press, the whole world basically, <laughs> and minister of education person who be responsible for, for the edu education for Brick sake, stands there and says, all gay people are pedophiles. And nobody bothers him. The gays are getting bothered now. Yeah. But nobody How long ago was that? It was a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. I remember because after that, 
we went on the, there was a pride the same year, we had a pride, and one of my friends, she got like stomps thrown on her, I think there was a, little, there was a certain <coughs> disconfiguration that there's something really wrong about all that, and especially that, that <coughs> I don't know, that I see Western, Western countries and I see people like my people so trying to be Western. Yeah, you deal with your own problems first, <laughs> you know, it's okay. But you know, I mean, the whole gay struggle, for example, feminist struggle, they've always had, you know, problems. You know, yeah, but you know, this, guy, they, this, this guy, sorry, one more thing, he also said that uh, kids should not be taught uh, evolution in school, because we are created by God in his own education. So it should be a choice when you get to a higher education for you to learn uh, evolution. Which yeah. is basic for medicine, basically. We need to, we need to know that. But, yeah. <laughs> no, it's really quite... And, and these are very important comments, because if we're talking about how these discourses get established, and how does one actually mm. analyze them, and how do they become incorporated like, uh, like a bad disease inside of yourself, you know, this kind of thing, you need to get a sense of how this materiality operates. And it's not just that someone says something and everybody goes, yes, no that they create little pieces of floating fluff, or floating garbage, you know, and we breathe it in. And it becomes part of how something is made manifest. So this kind of materiality, that's what we're talking about here, how this, this kind of dream material starts to make itself known. And why that then becomes a feature of judgments, because they're not logical necessarily, you know, I mean, and and when you think about all the different, I, I mean, I can certainly think of many, many um, marches, having water cannons put on me, you know, lying down flat, knowing how to, you know, not get picked up by the police, getting picked up by the police, how, how to, you know, you know, always wearing leather so you didn't get bitten by dogs, I mean police dogs. You know, or if you did, you know, that they wouldn't break so much skin and how you could, you know, what was the best way to get a dog off of you. You have to learn these things. Never wore your long scarves, don't have hanging earrings, you know, because if you were going on any of these marches, you could really get hurt. Someone would just rip your ear out, or they could take your scarf and strangle you, or, you know, there's various things, you know. It's like, you know, today I always, often I find myself when I go to some of these gay pride marches, which I don't usually go very often because I find them so boring, uh, you know, I, I am amazed at the fact you could wear a scarf and not think about it. That to me is amazing in this time period, in the same time period where, you know, not that long ago people were putting water cannons on you. But in other places of the world, they're still putting water cannons, you know. And, and in fact, as it turns out, in the U.S. or in Canada, they're still putting one. It's like, you know, God, the more things change, the more things remain the same. It's all a bad dream. Yes. Sorry, I come back to that was my minute. speech. Sorry, because we do have another thing to cover here. No, sorry, we'll, sorry. we'll get there. I just yes. wanted to ask a quick question yeah. in terms of dreams, because I, I was reading something when I was talking to somebody about that. Wait, say that again? I was, actually, I was talking to someone when I was, I was reading something about you actually dream in black and white, but you don't dream in colour at all until you open your eyes and you, then your senses, senses you know, perceive the colours that you thought you dreamed of. And going back to that, does that mean that the perception, I'm just allowed to use a word there, um, of the colors Only of barely, barely can use the word perception. Uh, down to the culture and the environment that we're in. So each dream is, can be seen as <coughs> very different depending on the color that is used in the dream. That's right, yeah. Colors are important in the dream. And, and also brightness versus darkness also important. That's why, the, that's why these are very, uh, let's say, you know, paint by number interpretations. <laughs> so you have to take that on the chin in a certain sense just so you know that it's just giving you a, a very light touch sense how this could conceivably work because there's, you have to minimally read uh, you know, dreams and interpretation of dreams, but beyond that there's a lot of work done on these notions of interpretations of dreams and, uh, you know, I mean, in um, this whole question of how one understands aletheia, aletheia being a certain form of truth, A-L-T-H-E-I-A, -E aletheia. That this form of truth, this assemblage, this this form around which uh, discourses present themselves, and they and they create uh, not just common sense, but they create the nightmare, the common nightmare 
but they create a common haunt, a haunting, a specter. These are very important notions. In fact, there's a, there's a, um, there's a theorist named uh, Reich, R-E-I-C-H. Um, and Reich wrote The Mass Psychology of Fascism. He, let me, let me preface that. Uh, this is, I wasn't going to say this tonight in the um, discussion, but now that I thought about it, I'll, I'll bring this in. With Marxism, with Hegel, then Marx, we know from last semester that the materiality of trying to figure out how you talk about truth was rooted in this question of dialectics. It was rooted in a type of material reality, eventually called historical materialism. That, the, that history creates a material that is every bit as real as this table. That, that this atmosphere or this environment that we are calling history, Foucault is going to call the history of the present, how we get here. Now this history had shortcomings because it was so broad brushed, it couldn't explain the oppression of women, you know, the, uh, the hatred of the Jew for why, what reason? You know, the hatred of whomever, the Muslim now, whatever, pick a, pick a, you know, lift a walk, find some group that is hated in, a, in an extreme way, in a way <coughs> that it is meant to cause, uh, you know, bloodshed and, you know, lynchings and all the rest of this. Listen to any uh, 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 Nina Simone um, song, the, you know, um, the, the uh, fruit, what's it called? Strange, 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 fruit. Strange fruit. Very important song. You, you can, here that you know that just the hanging people hanging from the trees um, but these are um, that these didn't this situation was not explainable by these broad brush strokes of Hegel and of Marx and so on and so the Adorno group the, Fra the so-called Frankfurt School Adorno Horkheimer Hannah Arendt uh, you could even, well, we'll just stick with that, Marcuse, they made the argument that you had to bring in, somehow you had to bring in the body, you had to bring in the sexual, because there were sexually uh, invoked reasons for why the Jew was hated, or the black person was hated, or the you know, woman was hated. These were, they were sexually motivated. So the question became, how does the sexual operate? And Freud became the most clear version of the port of call that you go to to try and get a sense of how one began to bring in sexualness. I say sexualness because I don't mean sexuality as such. I mean polymorphous environments. And if you start thinking about it, if it's true that we are polymorphously perverse, then why shouldn't people be sleeping around? then why shouldn't there be non-monogamy as a given? And why shouldn't, you know, they're, they're, these are the questions that all liberation movements have asked, and it's not a big surprise that every liberation movement, and I mean without exception, every liberation movement in time is always about sex and freedom of sex. It's fascinating, actually, the degree to which that wheel is invented every five minutes. You know, so everyone, anyway, the reason I mention this is because the obsession with Hitler, from the point of view of Adorno, as you know, for those of you that wrote on the mass debate on the Can You Write Poetry After Auschwitz, one of the questions was, why did people fall for it? Because it wasn't that they were stupid. Let's assume that at least there was about 50% of the people that weren't evil, and yet which is to say there might have been another 50% that were totally evil. They're like these evolutionary types, or these anti-evolutionary types that just, you know, just, just can't believe it. You know, just, just so stupid that you just, wow. Or, you know, in the States with this, you know, obsession with the guns right now and all these children that are dying left, right, and center, and yet they still pass the laws. The most recent one being last week when they passed the law to, 
to arm all the, all the teachers in the classroom. Like, there's, a, there, there, there's a solution. You know, okay. It's just, you just can't put, make this stuff up if you tried. It, it would fail as a novel. Anyway. So, so, so what Wright argues is that there's a sexual mass psychology to fascism where Hitler represents the father, where the female uh, person um, wants to sleep with the father. It's very Freudian, oh boy, you know, and, and uh, get rid of the mother, typical. That, you know, daddy's little girl is, on the one hand, as Jude was just pointing, is like the classic example of, um, yeah, see. Uh, is the classic example of, uh, of this, the, the Freudian comment about the girl requiring the ability to kill the father and sleep with the mother, but of course she has to do a double thing, which is eventually kill the father, uh, sorry, um, be, love the father, kill the mother. She has to go twice, so, so in a, in a um, the lecture complex is, you know, obviously different than the edible complex in that sense. They, everybody goes through an edible complex, and then the girls have to go through one more. The edible complex is get rid of the father, sleep with the mother. The electric complex is get rid of the father, sleep with the mother, and realize, oops, that means everybody's a lesbian, and go become and sleep with the father. So that's how a girl becomes heterosexual in the Freudian thing. Now, this mass psychology of fascism is worth taking a look at. Because at some point, one asks the question, what is it about the hatred, the sexual hatred of someone, to such a degree that it becomes a collective way of understanding the world? These positions, are what get incorporated into, let's say, the dream. They become collective symbols, or they become collective precipitate, or collective condensations, or collective displacements. And there's a lot of work on this. I mean, the early stuff is, of course, the Freud, which I think is not necessarily, you know, it's obviously he's writing in the 1900s. There's a lot has happened since then. But then you get someone like uh, Carl Jung, who writes in the collective unconscious, which a lot of people have, you know, positions yay and nay again about uh, animus and anima, and there's a lot of uh, different discussions. But I, I, I direct you to write because he then came up with an idea <coughs> that was part of this thing called the organ box. Has anybody heard of this? Kate, have you heard of it? Um, it was um, a precursor to the 60s and the fact that everyone should have orgasms. And there's some hilarious movies out that are basically like a Woody Allen type of thing, you know. Uh, so, I mean, not that Woody Allen is hilarious, but some of his work was kind of funny. Um, anyway, where, uh, you know, you touch this kind of uh, big ball, this big kind of energy source, and everybody's having orgasms. And a lot of sci-fi films that came out, particularly in the 60s, yes, you too, um, were, um, <laughs> were all about this, the collective sense of orgasming. This was a big part of a 60s, back to the, you know, back to the, I don't know, the plantation or whatever, back to the, the, the land, you know, um, of being, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Emphasis on rock and roll. Because this idea of the sexual as being a primary right that shouldn't be seen as Bacchanalian, shouldn't be seen as Dionysian, shouldn't be seen as anything, just the right to be free. You know, and you feel like the music should come up, you should be running in the fields, you know, or running in the beaches, or, you know, naked on a horse, or something. But this was the idea, that this idea, that, and, and these orgasmatrons, <laughs> which are fantastic, I can't believe that nobody's heard of these things. Um, I can't Bar believe Barbarella. It's Barbarella. Well, Barbarella, yeah. Well, it comes out. Thank you, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Barbarella. <laughs> but these, they come out of the uh, 
original uh, Reichian uh, comments on uh, on building these um, <laughs> orga or orgasmic uh, environments. And and you really must, if you have nothing else to do with yourselves, um, <laughs> get, get <one. laughs> That's right. Dear, this is not where this lecture was going to. <laughs> Let's try and get back on judgments. <laughs> Um, let's make sure that we recap where, uh, where I want to go with this. Um, it wasn't there. Um, okay. Right. So, um, just to kind of give you a sense. So, you have this idea of how the social gets established as a superego. And how the superego has, has an internalized relationship with the sexual with yourself. And that if there's a closure in this relationship, then the being that is created becomes uh, a sociopath or a psychopath. One of the studies that has happened um, with uh, monkeys, not that I recommend uh, studies, A, with animals, and B, them deducing from animals human behavior, but uh, is that they found that when, uh, when of course, in the way they would find it's annoying in and of itself, but if you take a, 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 a small mammal away from its uh, mother or away from its social environment, it will die. It will become, uh, you know, uh, non, non human, actually. And there was this huge obsession in the 1800s about finding children in the, you know, uh, woods in Paris in particular. The savage, uh, what do they call it? The, um, the noble savage. Um, where, I mean, a lot of people uh, would get rid of their kids by throwing them in the forest, and sometimes they died, and sometimes they would be brought up by wolves and the usual, you know, things that would go on, and there'd be these wild people running around, and so then the argument was, well, if you took that person and you brought them back into civilization, could you kind of cure them, what would you do, this kind of thing. And um, not to get into the whole sordid story of how insane this whole process was, um, the view that one can live without the sociality of life is uh, tantamount to closing off personality. So the sociality keeps one open, even if the sociality is in fact uh, nasty, brutish, cruel. It still is better, in a certain sense, than being in solitary confinement. If, if you see what things, so, th so there's still an opening. So, a child learns what they live, is the short version. And they learn it not rationally, but in their gut. And it's in everyone's gut. That gut is called the unconscious. And it's located, you know, between your stomach and your head and your foot. So, and it's this that you're playing with. This is what you're on your, uh, and, and there's a huge amount of repression that gets put in, and the society itself tries to dampen that down, goes the argument. Are we okay to go on to <coughs> jokes, or do we have, are you ready for the, I mean, I don't know, we pretty much, is there any, this is a very light touch on, um, on the interpretation of dreams, and I, I, I feel um, awkward on one level, uh, because I want to make sure that you get uh, this as something that isn't just a paint-by-numbers kind of interpretation of dreams mm -hmm. scenario. But since you asked for having this slide, I just wanted to bring this kind of element to the picture. But I see that uh, Andy Warhol's uh, uh, electric chairs are on here, yeah. Um, now, some people have argued, can you just show that for a second? Um, some people have argued that this, uh, thank you. Um, is uh, the way his paintings have, on disasters have, is basically part of a dreamscape. And there's, of course, the whole surrealist movement uh, and part, you know, the whole the, the, the chunk of it is dealing with the question of dreams. And one of the things I would ask you as an experiment or as a homework assignment or as something that you want to do is to try and see if you can express a recent dream, not one that you've like, thought about for any length of time, but express it using a material that you're used to playing around with, if it's a graphite pen or a pencil, or 
or if it's you know film or if it's water to see if you can have get the same level of intensity of the dream whatever that <coughs> is because I want you to get a sense of how something materializes and how the material becomes a condition and how the condition shapes you and the shaping is what is the ground so again thinking of ground not as in the floor but as something that can give you shape the ground itself is like an amoebic thing as opposed to a flat thing good exhausted dead all all good all okay okay let's move on uh let me just go to My computer is asking me to select an identity. <laughs> I could have my main identity. Yeah, God, That's scary. Okay, um, let me just go to. Okay, right. Okay, so the next thing I want to just mention uh, is the question of the joke. <coughs> we might circle back to the unconscious, but I want to make sure we get this joke business in here as well. Now the joke for Freud, and in fact one could argue as a, um, as a comment for a modern civilization, a joke is a playful form of judgment. So if the unconscious, pardon me, if the interpretation of the dream is a sexual interpretation of judgment and the joke is a playful form of judgment that will hopefully give you a sense of how judgment itself whatever this thing is called judgment has tone or timbre do you know what timbre is sound do you know how to spell it Good. Tongue. And what type of sound is it? Resonance. Resonance. Good. So let's go again. So the joke is a playful form of judgment. The dream is a sexual form of judgment. It is not to say joke on the one hand, dream on the other, because you could have a funny dream, I suppose. Although none of you have had one, at least the ones that spoke today. <laughs> <laughs> Must get out more. Okay. <laughs> but the joke, the joke is something that is playful in the judgment. Now, the play, what becomes playful in the judgment? It does not mean that you're nice. It does not mean that you're kind. The joke is not about being kind. It's not about being nice. But the joke is also, according to Freud, not about humiliation. If it is, it's a bad joke. It's a joke that doesn't work. So the joke, something that works as a joke, the question is, what makes something playful? And Freud gets into this analysis. Again, it's this notion of how a discourse is situated, about how something can become elastic, can have movement. And this elasticity or play, you know, when something has a play in its uh, if it's stretching, when it can play, then the ability to make it an accordion, as it were, in and out, moving, is what can establish the first level, or the first, I, I would say layer, but I don't mean layer in a sedimented sense, I mean layer in a dimensional sense. So it's the first layer of 
something that can create this tension of moving. And that in doing this moving, either, how can I explain this? So the movement that happens, happens by working off of the same principles of the dream, which is condensation and displacement. So the joke works when one understands and can manipulate or can somehow, the joke is the conscious version of a dream, let's say. By that I don't mean that you're consciously thinking of the dream. By that I mean you're awake when you tell a joke, usually. Okay, whereas a dream, you're asleep when you have your dream. And the sleep dream is a comment with the unconscious and the joke is the comment with the conscious, but it is playing the same game of condensation and displacement. And someone who's really good at jokes, like let's say Eddie Izzard, who can tell stories and stories and stories with their joke, is able to be playing the shell game of conden condensation and displacement on a continual basis. And that's why, you know when you gave your talk uh, the other day and you were talking about the familiar, or whatever, the, it, Freud says in his interpretation of uh, or jokes in the unconscious, he says that if you take a word like familiar and you, you make a ne neologism with millionaire, so you have familiar, so that, that, that becomes funny. What becomes funny about the joke is you were saying, oh, I don't understand why this joke is at all funny. But, but it would be, have been somebody who wouldn't have any access to, let's say, a trillions of money, trillionaire, let's say. But they become a trillionaire, and they become part of your family, and that's funny because that would never happen, and yet it does happen, and it happens. So it's all this kind of moving around and condensing at this conscious level, but if, in fact, it is still playing with the relationship of the unconscious. So I'm hoping that you can hear this bit. Now, that just says then, this means I'm dead again, that this relationship between playful and sexual as resonance, as tambra, has colors to it. In fact, jokes are often referred to as being off-color. That's when they tend to be sexual. Is it wildly hot in here? Oh. <laughs> are we okay? Very hot. So, the, the way in which the color becomes, again, not symbolic of the sexual, but some kind of displacement, condensation, relationship, is what's being asked of you to think about in this. How are you doing? You become very, very quiet. You look absolutely ragged. Are you okay? Have <laughs> you died? <laughs> Come back. Come back. So it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> or give us an orgasm, one or the other. It's the same thing. Well, I can't think of one. Of a joke. I'm, I'm trying to think of a joke. I'm trying to apply it to a joke. And I can't think you're trying of to apply joke. what to a joke? What you're saying. I tell you a joke. See what you think about this joke. Apparently, Freud started off his thinking about jokes because he came from a Jewish background. And there's a certain kind of humor that's very Jewish. And that humor is the kind of humor that basically takes this notion of um, the societal um, as always being annoying. There's something annoying about it. So that's always the basis. That's always the pivotal aspect of the joke. So here's the joke. Um, now watch it. That'll be fine. Uh, the joke is, so I, I don't even know if I've even told you this joke before. So there was this man, and he ran out of money. 
and he was very exhausted and he had a family and he was an artist and everything that could possibly go wrong was going wrong and nothing was selling. It was awful. He was getting more, did I have I told you this? Okay, so he was getting more and more exhausted and more and more defeated and more and more upset. And uh, he started, you know, growing a beard and he never washed his hair and he looked like a complete wreck. And um, so he went to um, the uh, local, you know, club and he, you know, he said, you know, my life is terrible. And, you know, and the guy said, well, you know, you look kind of terrible actually. You know, you really should, I don't know, take care of yourself a little bit. He goes, how can I, you know, I come home, I, everything's awful, it's just terrible, I can't get better. And he said, well, you know, I, I think that if you did, then things might get a little bit better for you. He said, I'll tell you what, I give you some clothes here, and you can use the shower, and you can shave and get cleaned up. Well, I was like, all right. So he tries on the clothes, they fit him, and he's mm, not so bad. He shaves, he looks a little bit better. Next day he's better, about two weeks later, he thinks, you know, this is kind of working. I mean, you know, it's like kind of fake it till you make it. You know, it's like I feel a lot better. He's going around, mm, it's not so bad. He starts making some interesting art. The art, you know, gets taken up. He gets spotted by a gallerist. The gallerist loves his work. They start paying for him. He starts making a lot of money. He cannot believe this. He's like buying some nice suits. About six months go by and he gets run over and killed. And he can't believe it. <laughs> and he goes to heaven and he says to God, I don't believe this. I worked for 40 years. I slaved. I was a disaster. I was horrible. Everybody was ill and dying. The minute I get on my feet and I start doing well, I get run over and killed. Why? God says, hmm, to tell you the truth, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> okay, so that's the joke. Okay? Right. Okay, so now let's analyze this joke. <laughs> sad little joke. Okay, I can tell you lots of Jewish jokes. Okay, this is my sad life. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. So, in this joke, the joke is, of course, that A, he's arguing with God, B, God is fallible, because God doesn't recognize, and God feels bad. That's the other aspect. And if God could change things, he would. Of course, he is God, so he could have changed it, but anyway, he doesn't. So that's so the joke starts going in these layers. Okay. Now, what Freud is basically saying is that the reason it works, to the degree it works, is because, A, you have to have a sense of timing. So you have to know where the gaps are. Because just like in the unconscious, or just like in the relationship between conscious and you can't have it closed. If you have it closed, it's not going to work. So you have to have pauses, you have to have breaks, you have to, have, you have to know where to let it go and where not to let it go. So it's a form of performance. But the, perform but the discourse performs. It's not like you actually are, well, in this case I was actually performing, but it's, it's the relationship between how something can be put out on the table, as it were, but with all of its holes, with all of its pauses, with all of its gaps. If you don't have those things, it's not going to work because it'll be too closed. So that will be the situation with your work, for example. If your work becomes too solid, if it doesn't have these openings, and by openings I don't mean literally that you have a rip in it, although possibly, but if it doesn't have something that resembles an opening, and at the same time can pull in something familiar, it's not gonna work. These are what, for, so, so I'm just trying to get you a sense of how the material operates. Now in a postmodern world, that materiality is called acoustic. Not because it's about, this is what we were talking about this before, it's not because it's about sound as such, but because sound can't be, you can't hold the sound, but it's still material. So that's why it's called acoustic. And some of the people that write on it, um, some of the earlier writing, some of like Nigel Thrift too, work I think is interesting but not significant on this, 
or, or more importantly, uh, Delanda, uh, Douglas uh, Kahn, K-A-H-N, writes on noise. Um, these are all questions of how something creates this materiality that has <coughs> gaps, <coughs> has spaces, and it's a different way of understanding how the space operates, how, <coughs> they, how it, it still creates something that is coherent, but there's, that there's a, an ability around which one can have flexibility, play. So if you want your artwork to be funny, then it has to have that, you have to figure out how the play operates. The play in this sense of <coughs> openness, pausing, and by funny, when I mean funny, I, I mean, I don't mean gentle, because you could have the kind of humor um, that's, um, I can't even say it now. Um, dark humor. Um, actually, there's, uh, does anybody know the work of uh, Lewis, um, Well, Jack D, for example, okay, you know Jack Louis D. Louis C.K. Yeah, What's his name? Louis C.K. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's very good. Um, there's also John Stewart. Uh, I'm here, watch The Daily These are Americans, uh, the, John, the, John, the Daily Show. He's hilarious, but his hilarity is always caught up in a kind of a political statement. So he's, but what, what's being done is that the discourse is established. By discourse, we mean the materiality of the field, not the speech. So we're getting away from linguistics in this sense. It's the, it's the materiality of the field. It creates a discursive environment. That discursive environment has holes in it. Has folds, F-O-L-D-S in it. Holes, H-O-L-E-S, and folds. Holes and folds. It has rhythm. The rhythm Today's uh, tutorial, where uh, they were, where uh, Sally was talking about the patterns, they form the pattern forms a rhythm. No one really picked up on this whole comment I was making about uh, um, camouflage, because the idea was the pattern was you know people were talking about how the same gets repeated, but you can repeat the difference as well. That's more complex, of course, but you can still do it. And when, the, in fact, your work does that a lot. With the way in which it paint, the, the way in which the paint and the um, and the, um, the the film create a very specific sense of unity, even though there is no unity, and that's what keeps getting repeated. And in fact, Nietzsche's Eternal Return, it's the eternal return of the ability not to close that is going on. So. If you get anything out of today's sort of odd landscape, I think that's what this was today, a little bit more odd than I thought, partly because this died and partly because I was concerned about the way in which we were interpreting dreams as a little bit uh, superficial, but not in a terrible sense. It's the first time, I assume it's the first time you people, you, you guys have heard ego, id, super ego. Is that True, I mean, in terms of an analytic sense. Okay, so when you decide which question you want, because it may be that you start playing with your dreams as part of the essay question, um, though we connect with Heidegger, so you can't have too much fun. Yeah. Um, but you'll have some fun. Um, the, uh, the way in which you think about how something has to stay open, how the openness of the X, whatever it is, is what creates the ability for it to make sense, literally create sense. It's got something to do with this opening. And for the, the Freud move, it's the way in which the unconscious is able to be expressed, not in a coherent form, because the joke is also linked to an unconscious. The unconscious is this relation between ego, id, superego, preconscious. We can talk about that today, but this relationship. And so you, it gives you a sense, literally a sense, of how one deals with something that is that has a logic to it, 
but the logic isn't the Hegelian rational position of the subject. It's this other logic. This is the log logic that you're being asked to tap into. I don't know how more I can how, how more how much more I can push that. I mean, uh, where it's almost at the hour anyway, but I don't want to. I don't know. Maybe we have another joke. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <coughs> um, what do you think? Anybody else have a joke? Yes. Okay. I have a really interesting joke. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. But I think it shows you how jokes, physicality, updates consciousness. I have a theory that this is what goes on in jokes. Okay. That your body, and, and you don't realize it until the last minute. Okay. And I don't know if it's true of all jokes. I'd be really interested if you could think about <coughs> exceptions to this. A farmer plants a field of dildos. What is his biggest problem? He thinks they're going to grow? Quarters. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? It's physical. I was going to rather have seen physical image that comes unwillingly to mind. Or willingly. <laughs> <laughs> you said hopefully. Um, so what is it? So can you now enlarge? Can you now expand upon your theory? <laughs> I can expand upon my theory that um, comedy, and it, you won't like this because I'm going to talk about signifiers. <laughs> but um, comedy is when you have a signifier um, with no object, and then you suddenly realise um, it has no object. So no, I'm not putting this well. Um, it's, yes, it's about um, consciousness getting it wrong in the body. Or a different way of putting it is that it's about how something is displaced. So the answer that you would think would be coming gets moved aside, yeah. and either no answer comes up, that's the kind of either humiliating shame version of it, or some other answer that is clever and works from another whole field comes in and ends up being the object of the punch, as it were, the punchline. Only that word in that context would make you laugh. In any other context, the word isn't. <laughs> well, dildo can make one laugh in the context, really. I mean, it has a... Any, any other jokes? Yes? It's very short. Okay. What's brown and sticky? A stick. What? A stick. <laughs> What's brown and sticky is a stick? <laughs> okay, let's see why that one doesn't look quite so good. It's probably one that you tell to children. Okay. A man walks into the bar. Yes. And puts his hat, takes his hat off, puts it in the bar. And another man walks into the bar with his dog. And the dog jumps, jumps onto the bar and chews the man's head. And the first man says, I don't like, like your dog's attitude. It wasn't my attitude, it was yours. Okay, Hannah. I think it's a really terrible, horrible one. I don't know if it's fine. Why? My old tutor told me to say that I'll get out. Okay, blame it on the This guy who phones up. Phones up work. Oh, yeah. Anyway, well, I mean, your daughter. Oh. <laughs> your tutor told you yeah. this? My gosh. That's what Campbell was like. What? <laughs> <laughs> you said that's a fact. <laughs> but it was, uh, I mean, it was like this thing where you go, oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's context. It's a tutor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the fact that your tutor told this is really even more bizarre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we must. But I mean, there's, there's an element to it which you kind of go, and then you realise that you're part of the guilt thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Which was awesome. Yeah. There's a, the thing where I don't know, I can't find it funny because it's quite funny. And you might, and you might laugh anyway. You might, you, you might layer up your kind of yeah. response mm -hmm. so that it, it, it comes out as a laugh. 
Right, when it could in fact come out as an anger. Yeah. But then it gets translated into a laugh in the context. It's a little outbreak of the id, uncontrolled, kind of mm -hmm. pops out, and you have this paroxysm, mm -hmm. jurisons of laughter, and you yeah. can't help it. <laughs> No, I really think it too. Just clap the lid back on again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but the laughing becomes almost the, the, the social, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, yeah. laughing, laughing it off, laughing the event off. Yeah. yeah. It becomes the lid that you're putting back on. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I know. <laughs> <laughs> It's translated from Polish, so uh, um, and it has a square wall, so I'm apologizing to everyone. <laughs> I think we can handle it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there is a man, he's a builder, and uh, his wife makes the most amazing sandwiches in the world, and he loves these sandwiches. And he goes to the walk every day, and he walks on the on the high building somewhere in the sky. So he sits down on his lunch break, he opens the little box, takes the sandwich out, he opens the sandwich, and the sand is huge eagle, flies by, grabs the sandwich, and flies away. So he what the hell? Uh, next day, same thing happened. He comes in, opens his sandwich, takes a look at it, and this huge eagle, the same eagle, flies by, grabs his sandwich, and flies away. On the third day, when the eagle grabbed his sandwich and flew away, he got really annoyed. So he ran downstairs, he chased after Eagle, he got to the forest, he saw that Eagle is landing on a big bit of the rock. So he hid in the bushes to watch what is this Eagle doing with his sandwich. And this Eagle opens the sandwich on both sides, <laughs> takes, the, uh, then takes the salad out, takes the tomatoes out, takes the cheese out, takes the ham out, <laughs> and he grabs both sides of the sandwich with his wings. Yes, he says, oh, I'm so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting much better now. <laughs> 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 the father <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Should we end on that that note? You have another. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just about marriage. It's about marriage. Yeah, marriage is overrated. Why not just find a man that you hate and buy him the house? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, that one was. No. Nobody knew what to do with that one. <laughs> but we could try. Now, part of it was the delivery, I think. Yeah, I'm not going to do No, but anybody else? Okay. Next week. Are we having class next week? Yeah, we have class next week, right? One more class. And technically, I would like it to be a wrap of um, what we're doing. So we, we said we're going to meet. Uh, the week when we come back, right? So that will be the rub of the class. But what I, what I would ask you is, should, do you mind, please? Could you read now? Could you a read, really read uh, the section in um, uh, the uh, interpretation of dreams on the on condensation versus displacement? You'll find it. Um, what section is that, Grace? Do you remember? Okay. Um, anyway, if you can look at that uh, section. And then um, what I'd like to do is connect it with the tensor bound in libido economy. So you get a sense of what this notion of the surface and how things are created with opening, closings, foldings. Or how we get, we're going to circle back to, uh, to Leotard. Okay? Um, that's it. Don't forget, for those of you that are applying for the PhD, 